What's going on, Bully Fam? It's your boy, the educator, the scientist, Mr. Double Muscle Line Bulls, bringing you another episode of Breeders Hacks. So, all right, guys, this is an episode. Um, you, A lot of you guys have been wanting this one for quite some time now. I've been putting it off, but it's been long enough. Let's get to it. Progesterone 101. So, as I said, um, this is an episode I've been kind of putting off because of the fact that I knew it was going to be jam-packed. This is actually the first episode that I le legit had to get my notebook out and write down my notes to make sure I covered everything in this episode. So this episode, for people that already know about progesterone, this episode is still going to be super helpful because this is great to be able to share with your clients. Say you're a breeder that understands progesterone, but you have clients who may breed to your studs and things like that. This is a great video to send to them so that they understand why they need progesterones done um, as well as understanding proper timing and things like that so it just makes it easier on your part as well as um, if you're someone who wants to understand progesterones you may not be as familiar with it um, this is a great episode and I mean hey even if you do understand progesterones I'm, I'm sure there's something you can learn from this as well there's always you could always learn something new so anyway that's what this episode is about today. We're going to cover um, A to Z when it comes to progesterones. Especially in today's day and age, um, a progesterone testing is really a must, 100%. You know, most breeders do it now. It's pretty much a gold standard um, as well as it just ensures that your breedings take. A lot of breeders will make it mandatory if you're going to breed to their studs that you get progesterone testing done. Like I said, pretty much everybody does it. Everybody does it now. And I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely the most accurate way to um, ensure that your breedings are taking. So what is progesterone, right? Progesterone is the hormone that's associated with um, heat cycles as well as um, pregnancies, you know? So like I said, what's so great about progesterone is we're able to measure it in units, which allows us to time when is the most optimal, optimal time for breeding as well as when it's the most optimal time for when we have puppies due and we can actually time our c-sections correctly which i'll cover on a little later in this episode so the way progesterone works as far as testing goes it's actually really easy you could even do it at home so the way it works is you're actually going to um draw the blood from the dog right you're gonna draw the blood um and you'll take that blood, put it in a, in a centrifuge tube or whatever the case may be, and you're gonna spin it down. The goal is to separate um, the serum from the blood um, when, you, when you drew the blood. So you'll have a, the clear serum on top and you have the red blood cells at the bottom. So you're gonna take that clear serum on top and usually mix it with like a buffer. And long story short, you take that blood sample, you're gonna go ahead and, and throw it in your progesterone machine and um, it's gonna give you a number. And that, based off of that number, is gonna tell us where we're at when it comes to whether we're breeding or whether when we have puppies do. So um, when breeding your female, say your female comes into heat, um, you usually have a two day window when she's most fertile. Meaning um, if you breed her in that two day window, um, you're gonna get a nice size litter, things like that. But say you don't do your progesterone testing, um, things like that, what can wind up happening is if you miss that two day window, you can either get smaller litters because your timing, you know, you, you didn't do progesterone testing, so your timing was off, or you can wind up with the breeding not taking at all because you didn't breed her when she was fertile, you know? So those are the two things that could generally happen when you're not doing a progesterone test. Um, but if you are doing progesterone testing, typically um, you are going to do your first artificial insemination breeding even if you're doing a natural tie, whatever, um, you're going to usually do that 48 hours after ovulation. So um, that's just something to be mindful of. That is going to be when you do your first AI. So and typically that's going to be at the number 15 nanograms per milliliter, right? So at, a, at around a 15, 48 hours after ovulation, that is when you're going to want to AI the dog, um, the female. Now, um, one th a few things to be mindful of is the first thing is this is what we use here in the u.s nanograms per milliliter right that's um how we measure our progesterone levels now in europe and things like that in other countries they may use something called um nanograms per mole which is a different form of of measuring the progesterone so that is also something to be mindful of is 
when someone is telling you, say you have a client that's telling you, um, this is what my dog's progesterone level is, or even if you're getting the dog tested and you're telling someone else, whatever the case may be, you want to be mindful. How are they um, measuring the progesterone? Because if it is at um, nanograms per milliliter, that's pretty much the gold standard here in America. That's what we use. That's cool. Most people will be going based off of this. But you do have some people who are overseas um, and they're going by nanograms per mole. Now, nanograms per mole is a much higher number than the numbers that we have here. So in order to match up, let's just say um, nanograms per mole versus nanograms per milliliter. So, for example, let's just say we have 45. Someone tells us they have a 45 nanograms per mole right 45 um that's the number that they're pulling right well in order to convert this to what we're usually using which is nanograms per milliliter you would divide that by 3.18 and that would give us um we would be at like a 15 nanograms per milliliter just to give you guys an example i know i write chicken scratch but long story short you take um 3.18 and that's what you divide against um the nanograms per mole um and like i said that's what they use over in like canada and things like that uh i'm sorry not canada i had somebody contact me from canada with it but different countries i mean um they're all different but here in the u.s for the most part it's always been um nanograms per milliliter so i wouldn't get too caught up and too crazy into that but that's just something to be mindful of if somebody contacts you and say hey you know my dog's a 45 i'm ready to breed you know what i'm saying um and they're not telling you if it's nanograms per milliliter per mole something to be mindful of now a second part of this right another thing to be mindful of is we're going based off of um our machine right we use the wanfo fine care um progesterone machine it's very close and very similar to the idex chart um, it's, it's, I, I believe it's off by like a point or two, something along the lines like that. But for the most part, um, yeah, this is what it kind of goes based off of, at least from the front half, from my understanding. But, um, there's different charts out there. So different machines go based off of different numbers. So for example, mini Vitus goes off of a different number. Um, and so on and so forth. So what I'm just getting at is that's another thing to be mindful of is what machine, um, are they using? And I'll put, a little picture here something like that as a reference um because i have a comparison of like idex versus minivitis and things like that so there's different machines as well which will give you different numbers it's still the same concept as far as ovulation ai things like that but the numbers may be different based off of the machine so that's why i get a lot of people who contact me and say hey should i breed at this number should i breed at this number um what number do you breed at and I try to tell them, well, the first thing is who is doing the progesterone testing? What is the machine? Um, what it, does it run off of? You know what I'm saying? Chart wise, is it, is it, is it a Wanfo? Is it an IDEX machine? Is it a mini Vitus machine? You know, um, things like that, you know? So that's just something to be mindful of, you know, um, what machine. So this is based off of our machine that we use, that we have on breedershacks.com. Um, but like I said, guys, you know, um, that's just something to be mindful of when they're doing your test. You can't compare this if this is a minivitis. You would have to change the numbers up. So that's important to ask who's ever running the test for you. Because, for example, IDEX, you'd want to breed around at a, like a 15. But minivitis, for example, is about twice as high. So you'd want to breed at like a 28. So you see what I'm saying? The numbers can get very different and get a little confusing. So just be mindful of what um, machine you're, you're using or getting tested with. So... What I've found is testing wise, I mean, it was a wise investment for us to get our own machine based off of how many tests we do every year. Um, but this is something you could easily do at home. But what I've found is that they typically, at a vet, it's gonna cost you anywhere between 50 to I've seen as high as like 200 bucks. So it all depends on the area that you're in and things like that. And that's gonna dictate kind of like the cost per test. So hopefully with some of the information I give you here now, it can help you save money um, and not having to test so much because a lot of these vets kind of like to take it a little overboard with testing and I'm going to explain why. But um, yeah, I mean, that, that's generally like the cost, like 50 to like 200 bucks. It, it, it's a wide spectrum. So now finally to our chart, right? So the way this is explained is like I said, on this side, we have our nanograms per milliliter, right? You know, um, on here. 
and then on this bottom part that I drew is pretty much our days in heat. So this is gonna be the standard heat cycle for about 70% of dogs. Um, especially with the exotic bully, what I found, and this is just my opinion, is that um, these dogs have been bred to be so masculine that there's an, an excess of testosterone in the females. So what happens is too much testosterone can cause very irregular heat cycles. So I found a lot of these dogs in this breed have had irregular heat cycles. So just something to be mindful of. So that's why, um, in my opinion, you can't go based off of the old school pit bull way of first side of blood, then you typically breed from day nine through day 13. You know, um, you, you may have some luck with that, but for the most part, I wouldn't go based off of that, you know, um, at least with this breed. So with that being said, um, this is how we look at the dog's heat cycle. So the first sign of blood, that's your day one. That's when you're counting day one. Um, when somebody asks you, hey, what day is she? Um, that's your day one. So and then you, you progress from there. So on day five, day 60, whatever, like I said, that was your first day sight of blood. So that's definitely something to be mindful of, especially with females that have more of silent heats and things like that. You can take, um, you know, like I'll take uh, a tissue paper or something like that and, and, and wipe quickly to see if there's some blood. Um, you can even take like a cotton swab and, you know, push, push that into her vulva um, ever so slightly just to see if you got some blood on it, you know, things like that. Um, like I said, especially with females that have silent heats, you know, you wanna be mindful of that because um, if you're negligent, um, that can really kind of hurt you. So anyway, first side of blood, that's your day one. Um, generally, what I do is around day five to I would say six or seven, the latest, I would get my first progesterone test done. That's just me. I would get my first progesterone test done because what's most important to me is not so much that she's a 15, but I want to make sure I'm catching ovulation. That's what's most important to me, you know? So typically around day five is when you'll see the start of ovulation. So typically what you would want to do is 48 hours after ovulation, is when you're going to want to do your first AI. That's when you're going to want to do your first breeding. And typically she would be about a 15. You know, that's the ideal scenario. Um, 48 hours after, after ovulation, she's a 15. You do your first AI, you know. So um, before day five, though, she her numbers are going to be very, very, very low. Very low. You know, um, anything under, I would say, based off of the, uh, the Wanfo machines, um, she's going to be under a two, you know, for sure. And then once you hit day five, she'll be like a two and up, you know? So with that being said, anything before a five, day five, you know, uh, uh, the ovulation, she's probably not going to be very flirtatious with any dogs or anything like that. She'll probably be acting, you know, mostly like her normal self from day five to generally day 13, or from, you know, um, a five progesterone, generally to like your 15 to 20 mark, um, she's going to be very flirtatious. You know, she's gonna wanna allow studs, males, to mount her to do the breeding and things like that. She's gonna be a lot more flirtatious, you know? Um, and as you get closer to your 15, to your AI mark, um, 48 hours after ovulation, um, she's gonna become more and more flirtatious, where in the, be like, in the beginning of it, she may allow them to, to smell her and whatnot, but she probably won't let them mount her. Um, as soon as she gets closer to your AI mark, that's when she's going to, going to allow um, males to mount her and things like that. And that's also a great indicator to tell, okay, you know what? It's close to uh, time for breeding. You know, um, I had an instance once that uh, a client of mine, um, he missed when was the first day of blood. Um, I went over and that was one of the sure signs that I saw. It was that she was allowing the males to try to mount her. So I said, you know what? Let's do a progesterone very fast since you don't know what day she started bleeding. Sure enough, she was about ready to go. So we did that breeding. Um, with that being said, another sign as well that you're closer to this mark other than doing a progesterone is the blood. Usually when she's in her first days of, of, of sight of blood, um, it's a very dark blood. You know, and as you get closer, you know, to your day nine, 11, 13, um, and get closer to your 15, 
your AI day, um, it's going to get more pinker. You know, it's going to get very light in color. So those are also things that I go based off. I go based off of progesterone, but I also look at those other things as well, you know, and that kind of helps guide me, you know. So like I said, I'll look at the blood. What color has it gotten darker? Has it got, I'm sorry, has it gotten lighter? Um, I also look at, like I said, is she allowing the males to uh, mount her? I strongly believe that males have like the best progesterone machines in their noses, you know? So allowing a male to kind of dictate and tell you what's going on is also going to help a lot if you don't have a progesterone machine, you know? So um, those are other things to be mindful of as well. So generally what's happening in this cycle is like I said, she's bleeding and then um, she's releasing new eggs. When she has the new eggs, they have to mature. Once they mature, it's time to fertilize them. Once they're fertilized, that's when now your dog is pregnant. We wait our 60 days, you know, pups are born, you know? Um, so with that being said, um, some things to be mindful of, right? When you're doing this whole um, progesterone timing thing, some of the things that you need to be mindful of is, is the semen being shipped? If so, then you definitely need to make sure you're on top of your progesterone timing. Because say, for example, uh, you wait to test and you test and she is a 15 that day. Well, you're going to have a little bit of an issue because you know what? You, you're, that was your day. So if you have to wait for semen to come in um, and it won't be until the next day, then you're going to have to do a surgical because she more than likely will be a 20 plus. So that's another thing to be mindful of. And I should have said this sooner is 48 hours after ovulation is when you're going to do an AI. But about 72 hours after uh, ovulation is when you're going to do a surgical. Don't mind my chicken scratch. You're going to do a surgical 72 hours after um, ovulation. So that's another thing just to be mindful of um, is when you have um, semen being shipped, this is something you also have to put into account because it will take at least a day to get to you. Sometimes it could be two days, which yet again, this is something you want to all be mindful of going into this, you know, um, see how long it takes for the semen to get shipped to you. And you can factor that in to your timing when you're doing your progesterone testing. So another thing as well that you need to be mindful of that I just thought of is when you're doing your progesterone testing, some vets don't have a machine in their um, facility. Some vets actually have to take the blood and I have an episode on how to package up the blood and ship it out. But long story short is they package the blood up and they ship it out to get tested at another lab. They don't have an in-house in lab. So that's one of the biggest things. If I was to do a uh, progesterone testing from through a vet, that is the first thing I would ask them is I would say, how long does it take to get my results? If it's at 15 minutes, then I know they have a machine in house. Um, if they say it takes uh, 48 hours, then I know that they have to ship it out somewhere. So let's give you a prime example that let's just say we test her on day six or seven and they tell us it takes two days to get the results, right? Well, if we tested her on day six or seven and she was in ovulation, we won't get the results until about day nine. So if it takes, if we did a test on day six or seven and we got the results on day nine or 10, she may be ready to breed on day nine or 10 and they're giving us the results from two days ago. So the thing is, is that two results from two days ago are only good for those two days ago. So now let's just say you did a test and it was on Monday and now uh, they're giving you the results on Wednesday. Those results on Wednesday were only good for Monday. So now she's a completely different number on Wednesday, if that makes sense. So on Monday, she could have been a five, but on Wednesday, she could have been a 10. And that makes a humongous difference. So I hope that wasn't too confusing, but long story short is that when you do that test, those results are for that day. Not for, um, you know, if you test her, like I said, on day five and they give you results on day nine, those results aren't for day nine. You're going to have a completely different number, as I said. So like I said, she could be a 10 on day nine and a, and a five on day five. But if they're giving you results from day five, even though it's day nine, the results are going to be this number, not this number. 
if that makes sense. I, I hope I hope that was, you know, I hope that wasn't too confusing. So another thing that I forgot to mention is um, surgical timing versus AIs, right? So with an AI, I said that you generally want to do an AI, um, your artificial insemination 48 hours after ovulation. Well, with a surgical, you're typically wanna, gonna wanna do that 72 hours after ovulation. Now, the reason being though, is because of the fact that with a surgical, it saves the semen about a day um, in having to swim to where um, the eggs are. So for example, with a surgical, a vet is actually going to make a small incision and place the semen right at the horns, right where um, the eggs need to get fertilized. So it saves them a day in having to swim versus if you did an AI, um, right from where the AI was, you know, from the vulva, it has to travel all the way through and two to get to the eggs, which takes about a day. So that's why you would do a surgical a day after um, your AI day. So I prefer AIs. I get a lot of people who ask me, which do I prefer, AIs or surgicals? Um, but I do feel that surgicals do have their place. Um, and I would say, for example, if timing wise, the, she the semen couldn't get to me on time um, and we were looking at closer to this 20 year mark, I, I would do a surgical. No problem. I believe surgicals have their place, um, but they're I, 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 I prefer AIs. You know, I feel that with AIs, you can get better coverage because what I would do is this is general. This is a general rule of thumb. But with an AI, what you can do is I would breed, and, and this is just ranges, because the semen can live for 24 to 48 hours. So if you did a breeding at a 12 uh, nanograms per milliliter, and you did another AI at about an 18, you'd have some really nice coverage, because if you did um, a breeding here at when she was like a 12, skip a day, and then breed again the following day, um, you have a really nice window um, that you're making sure that you're hitting. So if you were at a 12, generally um, the next day she would be about a 15. Then the next day she would be about an 18. And you would be covering about this span of time, you know, which is a really good window to cover. So that's why I like, a, that's why I like AIs because you can get a better, coverage with it i mean and then you could get crazy with doing like three ais and stuff like that but i think uh, a two two breedings is a really good window to cover if you're doing progesterone timing i think you can really do a lot with two windows i mean if you're doing proper timing i mean i've done plenty of breedings with just one breeding and i and i always hit my mark so just something to be mindful of that's why i prefer ais um, that's why you do surgical 72 hours after ovulation instead of 48 like an ai um just some background information. And I cannot stress this enough. Don't get stuck on one specific number. Dogs come into ovulation at different numbers and different times, and it's a little bit of a variation. So as long as everything is adding up, you know, you're looking at what is the color of the blood, it's maybe seeing what the stud is acting. And I mean, and even if you're just going off of your testing, you know what I'm saying? And watch for that ovulation and wait for that, that slight spike to go up. Like I said, you can breed as early as like a 12, you know, skip a day, then breed again at an 18. You could breed at a 16, you know, um, let's just say she's a 14. I would breed at a 14. You just want to be in around that, that 24 to 48 hour window from that 15. So another thing that I didn't mention as well, actually, is um, what's called a split heat. So now a split heat is, and let's just draw this out, is let's just say a female starts to go into heat and then stops. You know, she's starting to climb, she stops, and then kind of stays stagnant or goes down and then starts to go creep back up and then goes right back into heat. You know, so it may seem like she was coming into heat and that she went right back down um, it may seem like she came into heat and came out and you, it may seem like you have missed it. You know, um, one thing that I did notice, um, and don't hold me to this, but what I found is that the, the, the way to tell if you, you missed the female, if you missed the heat was the fact that, um, generally their numbers stay up. So if you test the dog and she's like a 20, then you know that you like missed the heat, you know what I'm saying? Or like she's a, a 30, 40, whatever, you know, you missed the heat. But if her numbers are still low, then she may just be having a split heat. That's something to be mindful of as well. So anyway, with the split heat, like I said, um, 
it, that, that's why they call it a split heat because right in the middle of it, it breaks up and then it'll come right back in and go back up. This generally happens with younger dogs um, under a year and a half old. Um, I mean, with the exotic bully, I have seen older dogs that get it as well. Um, it's one of those things I do know of people who have used certain things to try to uh, remedy this, like AC HCG for one of them and things like that. Um, but I I'll probably do an episode going more into the split heats and things like that. But that's just something to be mindful of as well when it comes to um, doing your progesterone testing. That may be something that you come across. So here's the next part I wanted to touch on quickly. So what a lot of people don't realize, and vets get this wrong all the time vets get this wrong all the time um is timing when it comes to c-sections so they'll do their ai on this day and say you know what let's just count 59 days from this or 60 days from this date and we'll cut right here you know or whatever the case it may be you know and it sometimes you know for the most part it, it works out but sometimes it doesn't and i'm going to explain why right so when it comes to timing your c-section and that's the great thing about progesterone um when we backtrack is you can do what's called a reverse progesterone so let's see let's say your female's pregnant um and there's definitely multiple ways to confirm she's pregnant you can do x-ray ultrasound a relaxing test that's what we do things like that so let's just say you confirm that she's pregnant and um you want to see how far she is from her c-section so let's just say it's day 57 she could be like an 11 but as you get closer to your actual whelp um to when the puppies are going to be here naturally the number gets lower and lower and lower so it'll go from an 11 it'll go down to eight it'll go down to six it'll go down to four and keep going down until you hit a one generally a one is when the puppies are going to be here within 24 hours a two um can be a little bit more than that uh, a three is generally within like 48 hours you know um and anything over a three you don't want to do a c-section so a three and under a three and lower is safe to cut to do a c-section anything higher than a three you want to wait because i've seen dogs where they've dropped down to a four then they go back up to a five you know and this could be for days going on. So some of the dangers of not having your C-section timed correctly um, when doing a reverse progesterone, and the thing is, is this, right? If you're breeding exotic bullies, it's a, it's a must that you get C-sections. It's almost unethical not to, you know? This breed, um, it, it's very unrealistic to expect this breed to um, have puppies naturally. So that's, I'm talking about the exotic bully. Um, I also kind of recommend this for American bullies as well, but um that's just my opinion so anyway so some of the dangers of um cutting the puppies open based off of the traditional way of we're gonna count you know 59 days 60 days from the ai is that um if the timing is wrong you know and your c-section isn't for another day or two but she starts having the puppies now you're going to be paying an expensive, expensive C-section. That can be, I've seen it as high as like $5,000, you know. Um, another thing is that the pups can be born in the middle of the night and a puppy gets stuck. And now you lost all the rest of the puppies that was behind that puppy as well as possibly the female. Or even worse, you could do the C-section and everything seems to be okay. And maybe some don't survive, you know, and then you take them the, the puppies home. And then within a week. The rest don't survive. And it was probably because of the fact that you may have cut them open too early and their lungs weren't able to make the switch yet, you know, because you had did the C-section too early, you know, um, even though you were going based off of your 59 day rule that the vet told you, you know, um, and what ended up happening was their lungs didn't properly adapt yet and they faded on you within the first week. That can also happen as well. And it happens a lot more frequently than people think or understand, you know, so that is a key thing. Um, so the, the, the best rule of thumb, the best rule of thumb is to, um, count 63 days from ovulation, 63 days from ovulation. You generally have a two-day window 
most people go off of their AI when, when they did the AI and that is completely wrong. So let me show you why we don't go based off of that and why that's completely wrong. And actually this should be corrected. So it should be 63 days. So the correct way is to go 63 days from ovulation. Now, the reason why I believe it's flawed and why a lot of people go based off of the AI day and why, in my opinion, it is the incorrect um, number to go based off of is because of the fact that she is going to have the puppy 63 days after ovulation. If you go based off of AIs, here's where you could run into problems. So if you, if you AI too early, let's say you AI too early, what's going to happen is we should have... Let's say maybe you didn't get a progesterone test done or your progesterone was done inaccurately, whatever the case it may be, um, and you breed too early. What's going to happen is she's going to go into a natural well. She, you ha Day 63, you have a two-day window. But let's just say you breed too, too early. Well, that is going to put you a day or two before your two-day safe window to cut the do the C-section which will in turn lead to premature puppies. Premature puppies, um, if you've ever dealt with premature puppies, I mean, it can be a real hassle and um, in inexperienced hands, you're more than likely going to lose the puppies as well as the fact that, like I said, if they're just too premature, you're gonna lose them, you know? So, and this could have all been avoided by waiting a good day or two, you know? If, if they would have also done a reverse progesterone that, that would have told you, you know what? We did a reverse, she's an 11 or she's a six or whatever. We need to wait another day or two. But like I said, that's because they did the AI too early. So they counted, um, they started counting too early from um, day six, for, for, for the day 61, I'm sorry, for day 60. So the other problem is let's just say we breed too late. Well, what's going to happen is let's just say we still follow through with that 60 day rule. The puppies are gonna actually be here two days early. So we're gonna get caught with um, pups in the middle of the night, not prepared, paying for an emergency C-section, praying to God puppies don't get stuck, things like that, you know? So if we go, if we, if the flaw and the problem is if we AI too early, you're going to get puppies um, too late. You'll wind up doing the early C-section. If we do the AI too late, then you end up with puppies early. So that's where, like I said, ovulation is the key, going 63 days off of ovulation. I hope this was easy to understand. Like I said, guys, you know, just to reiterate, if you, that's why I don't go based off of the AI day. Because if you AI too early, you're going to get puppies. Um, they're going to be too late. You're going to cut them open in the, in, and they'll be premature. If you um, AI too late, then you're going to have the puppies earlier because this is the two-day window that the, that she's going to uh, start to whelp. The puppies are going to be here. So as I, see, as I said, you see, you're expecting the puppies here, but they're really going to be showing up here. So this is what happens all the time. So like I said, you know, um, people are going off of the AI days and that's why they're either getting premature puppies or they're having puppies um, in the middle of the night, even though they planned a C-section. So with that being said, um, that's why we always go based off of the ovulation day, 63 days after that. And that's why we do reverse progesterones. Because like I said, if we do a proge reverse progesterone and she's an 11, we know we have time. If she's at a three, I would recommend, you know what? Hey, we're going to cut her today. You know, um, if she's a two, you know, a one, she's uh, one, she's going to have puppies within 24 hours. Um, and I'm going to do another episode kind of going more into detail as far as, um, what I do leading up into the female, um, for the C-section, for example, typically within the 24 hour window, her temperature is going to drop. So that's why I recommend, um, taking her temperature every day. Once you're closer to that 50 day, 57 mark, you know, I like to catch it a little early and have a baseline, but things like that, you know? But reverse progesterone will be your friend. So just as you did a progesterone with the numbers going up, you'll do a progesterone with the numbers going down. And it will tell you the same thing when puppies will be here. People always, always get confused. And they think that, you know, based off of when you do the AI is, is going to dictate when the litter will be here. That's not the case. The litter is always going to be here 63 days after ovulation because that's when the egg started to get mature, started to mature, you know? So there's no control. 
just because you felt like AI in here or you felt like AI in here or AI in here, that doesn't magically dictate now when she's going to have the puppies. And that's the mistake a lot of breeders make. She was, oh, she was always going to have the puppies 63 days after ovulation. So um, the only difference that your AI may have made or your surgical, surgical may have made is maybe the size of the litter, but it, didn't, it doesn't dictate when the litter is going to be here, if that makes sense. And another thing, and another thing to be mindful of, and another thing to be mindful of is before you even think about doing a C-section, you're going to want to confirm. You don't want to cut a female open just because you thought she was pregnant and you find that there's no puppies there. That's an even kind of worse situation because you spent this money, you put the dog through this for the dog to not have any puppies. I mean, um, that's just something that I would highly recommend doing either a relaxing test, an ultrasound or a um, x-ray just just to make sure that there's some puppies in there you know so i hope this was helpful guys um i may even do a part two drop a comment down below let me know if you guys want me to do a part two but i hope this was kind of simple to understand i know it's a lot of information at once but um if you guys can really kind of understand this and grasp this this will definitely help you and set you up for success to always get nice healthy big litters that always take you know and um for people that may not have access to a progesterone machine if you had to ask me what i would suggest is do your breed breed on day 9 11 and 13 if you have no progesterone machine at all and you know you have a good that it will give you a good amount of coverage and hopefully the breeding takes but nothing can be guaranteed you know but with this gives you the most accurate results you know i've seen this compared to um vaginal cytologies where vaginal cytology is where they take um a smear from the vulva of the female they look at the eggs on the, on the microscope you know and based off of how the eggs look on the microscope um, I'm sorry, the cells, how the cells look on the microscope, um, that kind of tells you uh, where the female is at, you know, um, as well as I've seen people use the Dromsky. It's a long rod that they go ahead and insert in the female and it goes off of like electrical currents and stuff like that. This is the most accurate. I've seen firsthand people do testing of this compared to the other ways of timing, uh, timing um, of breedings. And this is always going to be the most accurate. So if you guys got any questions, drop a comment down below. I hope this information was helpful, guys, and I see you guys on the next episode of Breeders Hacks.